Hello, everyone, and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 23rd chapter titled A Family Relationship. While doing as per his desire, one should always remember that supreme entity is not the boss. That supreme entity is the loving father. The relationship is not official. The relationship is purely personal. As the new decade began, the spiritual lives of most disciples still revolved around seeing Baba in the Jagrati, going on field walk, and attending DMC programs whenever they got the chance. When they would see other Margis in the street, they would often embrace each other and shed tears. One day, Baba was talking with Shitij when he warned him that this devotional phase would not last much longer. You will all be sad to see it pass, Baba said. But Baba, Shitij asked, unable to hide his disappointment, why does this have to happen? Baba remained impassive. After the devotional phase comes the intellectual phase. Without an intellectual revolution, an ideology cannot be established. Around the same time, Baba made an unannounced trip to Calcutta and stayed with his brother, Himanshu, in Narkel Danga, close to where Hara Prasad was living at the time. In the evening, Baba walked over to Hara Prasad's house, knocked on the door, and invited his startled disciple to go for a walk. They walked out to Beliagata Lake, and remained there until 10.30. Before heading back, Baba told Hara Prasad, Now you people have me very close to you, but after a few years, you will have to look through binoculars to see me. Hara Prasad was shocked to hear this, but he quickly forgot about it. His sentiment echoed that of most Margis at the time. There was no sense of worrying about the future, when the present was enough to last a lifetime. The routine in the Olipur Jagrati continued much the same as it had been in the Rampur colony. Of the two rooms in the initial construction, one was reserved for Baba. The only piece of furniture contained was a wooden cot, which was covered with a cotton bed sheet and a pillow. The Margis cleaned the room each day with meticulous care and brought fresh flowers and kept them in a vase near the cot. These daily duties were considered a privilege for some fortunate disciple. A picture of Baba was kept on the cot whenever he was not there, and whatever Margis were present would sit in front of it during the morning and evening hours to sing devotional songs and practice their meditation. On Sundays and holidays, Baba gave general darshan, and occasionally, on weekday evenings, if the weather did not permit him, to go to the field. From time to time, he gave evening classes there for Acharyas and Margis. On rare occasions, he also stopped by in the morning to take care of the organizational work before continuing on to the office, a practice that grew more and more frequent as the 60s wore on and the organization continued to grow. On the days that Baba was expected for General Darshan, the Margis would arrive early and sing devotional songs in front of his cot until he arrived. Then either Pranay or Dasarath, or whoever was serving as his personal assistant at the moment, would direct the Margis out of the room. Baba would sit on his cot and complete whatever organizational work was pending. If he wanted to see anyone privately, he would call him. Then his attendants would open the doors and the Margis would file in. Baba would usually chat with them informally for some time and then give a discourse, often accompanied by a demonstration. Afterward, the Margis would do pranam one by one, and Baba would leave for home in the company of a few selected disciples, a number that was soon limited to five. No one else was allowed outside the Jagriti gate until well after Baba had left. This rule had been instituted 
because the Margis had developed the habit of running after Baba into the street, weeping and crying, giving vent to devotional feelings that the neighbors were unable to understand. This created a strange scene that the senior disciples felt was best avoided. Considering Ananda Marga's reputation in Jamalpur at the time, it is easy to understand their concern. Ramchandra, who later took initiation and became an ardent disciple, remembered his impressions of Ananda Marga when he was growing up in Jamalpur. I used to fear the name of Ananda Marga when I was young. We used to pass by the Ananda Marga ashram on our way to school. My schoolmates used to say that Ananda Marga was a place of great magic. It was protected by a magic boundary wall, and it was dangerous to talk when you were near it. So we used to remain silent whenever we passed by that compound. The word had spread all through Jamalpur that Baba was a great magician. I used to think that if I saw Baba, he can do something to me. So I always tried to avoid seeing him or letting him see me. During the 50s and early 60s, there was no system of recording Baba's general darshan talks or taking notes, nor did Baba redictate them afterward, as he did with his DMC and RU talks. Occasionally, some interested devotee will take notes of his own volition, but the vast majority of those discourses have been lost. In March 1963, one devotee took notes during a general darshan. The following excerpts show the informal nature of Baba's general darshan talks at that time. In the preface to his notes, this disciple explained that while it was too difficult to preserve Baba's exact words, the spirit of what Baba said was faithfully reproduced. As Baba took his seat, he said, In the Mahabharata period, we find two persons coming quite close to Sri Krishna, Arjuna and Sudama. Both were greatly devoted to him. Now tell me, which of the two is the greater devotee of Sri Krishna? And whom would you choose as the ideal of your life? One by one, the persons present there expressed their views. When all had expressed themselves, Baba said, Devotion means unconditional self-surrender. One who has more of it is a greater devotee than one who has less. Arjuna and Sudama were both great devotees. But while comparing their devotion by this yardstick, we have to say that Sudama was a greater devotee. Arjuna refused to fight when Sri Krishna asked him to do so. This shows that Arjuna did not have full faith in and complete surrender to Sri Krishna. On the other hand, we noticed a complete surrender by Sudama. He never desired anything from Krishna, his friend who could have given him anything and everything. Even when his wife forced him to go to Sri Krishna to request him to remove his poverty, he went to him but didn't ask for a thing. Now whom should you take as your ideal? Neither of the two, neither Arjuna nor Sudama. Neither of the two is perfect. So how can you take anything imperfect as the ideal of your life? Your ideal is to be perfect. So your ideal should be the Lord and the Lord alone. No one else should be your ideal. And if he finds that you have the potential to do his work, but you are lacking in self-surrender, and you have not forgone your ego, then in such a case, he will first create circumstances in which your ego will be forced to yield and surrender. Only after this will the Lord choose you to be the medium for his work. This was the case with Arjuna. Arjuna had the potential, but he also had some ego left in him. Sri Krishna first made him surrender by showing him his cosmic form and then alone was Arjuna chosen to be his medium. In one of these general darshans, Baba asked everyone if they wanted to hear the cosmic sound. Their response was an enthusiastic yes. 
Baba asked for the doors and windows to be closed. He had the women sit on one side and the men on the other. Then he asked everyone to begin meditating. Those who do not hear the sound, he said, should raise their hands, but remain silent. A few disciples raised their hands, but put them down again a few moments later. Sakal Dev, a lawyer for Musafarpur, started hearing the beautiful sound of a flute. The longer he meditated, the more it grew in intensity. But at one point, he felt a sudden urge to open his eyes. When he did, he was surprised to see Baba leaving. The rest of the Margis were deep in meditation. Some had already fallen into trance. Afraid that he might never hear that sound again, he ran after Baba and caught up with him just outside the gate. When he reached down to touch Baba's feet, Baba said, Sakaldev, what do you want? Mukti? Moksha? Baba, I just want to be with you. Tatas too, Baba replied. So be it. On another occasion, Ashupati was massaging Baba in his room while the other Margi sat on the floor around his cot. Baba's mood turned serious. He asked everyone if they wanted to witness divine effulgence. Naturally, everyone was eager to. Okay, Baba continued. I will show you one percent. You will not be able to stand more than that. Suddenly the room was filled with a sweet, bright white light. The joy they felt was so intense that everyone was forced to close their eyes. After a few moments, the light disappeared. You see, Baba said, and this is only one percent. Though not even one percent of the devotees' experiences with Baba in those early days has been preserved in writing, that which has is enough to dazzle the eyes of anyone who tries to look back at that period and imagine what it was like to be around Baba in the days prior to the intellectual phase, before the organization grew to become a global mission with hundreds of thousands of disciples. The Jamalpur Jagrati was the scene of many of those experiences, the one place, perhaps, along with the tiger's grave, that best evokes the aura of that period. What follows now are a few incidents that took place in the Jagrati around the beginning of the decade. Madan was a high school student in Bagalpur at that time. His family disapproved of Ananda Marga and didn't allow him to go to Jamalpur to see Baba. So he used to sneak out whenever he could and make the trip without permission. Late one afternoon, he slipped out of the house unnoticed and went to the station to board an express train to Jamalpur, a journey of an hour and a half. When he arrived at the Jagrati, he requested Pranay for permission to go on field walk, but the list was already full. Bitterly disappointed by his ill fortune, he went into Baba's room and sat for meditation. Instead of meditating, however, he began praying to Baba to make it rain, knowing that if it rained, Baba and the disciples would have to come back to the ashram. In the next room, there was an axe on the wall. When he remembered this, Madan mentally threatened Baba that he would kill himself with the axe if Baba didn't come to see him. Then he started fighting directly with Prakriti, insisting that she make it rain so that Baba would come back. After an hour of this supposed meditation, it started to rain. A short while later, Madan heard a commotion at the gate signaling Baba's arrival. Rather than run to meet Baba, as the Margis normally did, he kept meditating, thinking, if Baba really loves me, he will come and look for me, rather than make me search for him. A few moments later, he heard Baba asking, where is Madan? Madan felt a thrill. He got up from his meditation. The first thing Baba said when he saw him was, what do you think you're doing? You earn 50 paisa, and you go ahead and spend one rupee. Do you understand? No, Baba. 
Whatever you achieve in spiritual practice, you should not spend it. If you waste your power fighting prakriti or demanding something that you should not be asking for, then you are sure to meet your downfall. Do you want to leave Ananda Marga? Do you want to deviate from the spiritual path? No, Baba. I don't want that either. So from now on, do not utilize your spiritual power in such a foolish way. Do you understand? Yes, Baba. But I have to face so many problems to be able to come and see you. My family won't give me permission to come. And then I get here, and Pranayda won't let me go on field walk. Baba held up his hand. Okay, okay. But promise me, you won't do this anymore. Baba inquired politely about Madan's family and the local Margis. Finally, he asked him if he had money to get back home. He didn't. Baba reached into his pocket and handed him a two-rupee note. One day, Guarda was visiting his maternal uncle's brother, Ratu, and the talk turned to Anandamarga. Guarda tried to convince his relative of his guru's greatness, but Ratu was less than receptive. Look, Ratu said, there is one sure sign that all great spiritual gurus have. The big toe of the right foot is abnormally large. Does your guru have this? Guarda didn't know what to say, so he remained silent. Well then, Ratu continued, unless he has an abnormally large big toe, I can't accept him as a spiritual guru. A few days later, Guarda was sitting in the Jagrati with several Margi friends, chatting about Indian cinema, when Baba showed up unexpectedly. After everyone did pranam, Baba asked the boys what they were gossiping about. No one said anything. They were reluctant to admit that they had been discussing films in the sanctified environment of the Jagrati. I think you were gossiping about cinema, Baba said, with a smile on his face. Is it not? He turned and addressed Guarda directly. Okay, then. Tell me the name of the film in which this song is sung. Baba sang the first lines from a popular song. But neither Guarda nor any of the other boys could remember the film. What? Baba said. You all are experts in Hindi cinema. I don't see a single film. Try another one. Baba sang a few lines from another song, but again no one could guess what the film it was from. Then Baba turned again to Guarda. I can see that the name of the film is coming to you, but you don't quite catch it. Do one thing. Catch the big toe of my right foot and see if that helps. Baba stuck out his right foot and Guarda caught hold of the big toe. As soon as he did, he forgot all about the film. All he could remember was his relative's challenge. He was startled to see that Baba's big toe appeared to be abnormally large. The other Margi boys asked him if he remembered the name of the film. Yes, yes, I remember, he said. But he was so engrossed in Baba's toe that he didn't say anything else. After Baba left, he ran straight to Ratu's house to tell him that he was right. Baba's big toe was just as he had said it should be. Even after Pratiba took initiation, she continued to perform her traditional Hindu rituals at home. But instead of worshipping Krishna, she replaced her old idols with a photo of Baba. Each day, she would do her traditional arati, waving her tray with its lamp and its incense before the altar with Baba's picture. Once, after returning from the Jagrati, she scolded her daughters for not lighting the lamps on the altar. But this time, her daughters refused to indulge her. Now that you've joined Ananda Marga, you shouldn't do this anymore, they told her. This is not what Baba teaches. It seems your bad samskaras are not over with yet. Prativa became annoyed. Just because I've joined Ananda Marga doesn't mean I have to give up my old ways. I can still do arati if I like. And to think 
I have to hear this from my own daughters. Well, that is just too much. Prativa lit the lamps herself and began her arati. The next day she returned to the ashram to attend the Sunday darshan. Baba's talk was entitled Worship, Ritual, and Praise. During the discourse, he began talking about arati. While he was looking toward the women, he said, Just imagine if you were a god and someone started waving a lighted lamp in front of your face. How would you feel? Wouldn't you feel uncomfortable and ask them to stop? Wouldn't you tell them that your face is burning? Imagine if someone waves incense sticks in front of you. Wouldn't you feel suffocated from the smoke? Is it not so? Now imagine how the deity feels. At that moment, Prativa turned to the woman next to her and whispered that she had been performing arati just one day earlier in front of Baba's picture. Baba interrupted her whispered conversation. Yes, Prativa, I am talking to you. Why are you doing such a thing? Prativa stood up and folded her hands to her chest. Baba, I won't do it again. She grabbed her ears and started doing tick ticks as punishment without being told to do so. Ram Tanuka, the wife of Ram Kilavan, used to treat Baba as her son in the manner of a traditional Hindu mother. She reserved the right to quarrel with Baba whenever he did something that incurred her displeasure, a sense of intimacy that she would pass on to her four daughters, all of whom became ardent devotees. One day she came to Nityananda's quarters for darshan. This was before they had purchased the land for the Jamalpur Jagrati. Baba was sitting in the back room with Dasarath and Pranay when she arrived. The rest of the Margis were in the front room waiting for Baba to come out for darshan. After a short while, Pranay came out and announced that Baba had decided he would not give darshan anymore until the Margi solved the Jagrati situation. The Margis were saddened, but resigned. They resolved to do something about it as soon as possible. Not so Ram Tanuka. When Baba came out of the room and began receiving the pranams of the Margis before heading for home, she rebuked him loudly. I have been doing idol worship since I was ten, but I gave it up for your sake when I got initiated. The whole society has gone against me, but I haven't minded. I left them also and gave my whole mind to you. And you say you won't give darshan? Then what have I come to Ananda Marga for? Better you strike my name off the register of Ananda Marga. Dasarath tried to calm her down, but Baba put his hand on him to stop. Mother, you are quite correct, he said, like a son being chastised by his mother. He sat down and gave darshan. Some months later, she attended a darshan in the newly constructed Jamalpur Jagrati. When she entered the room, Baba was sitting on the cot with his legs hanging over the side. Also entering the room was a poorly dressed man in his fifties from Darbanga who was carrying a pitcher of water that he had drawn from the well. A couple of margis including Bindeshwari, had asked him not to sit close to Baba. They were rather perturbed that someone who looked more like a beggar than a devotee was in the darshan hall at all. But the man did not pay them any heed. He managed to get a seat right in front. Once everyone was settled, he positioned his water pot and reached out with a pair of unsteady hands in an obvious effort to wash Baba's feet. As soon as he reached out his hands, Baba pulled up his feet and sat cross-legged. When she saw this, Ram Tanuka became incensed. Baba, you put your feet back down right this minute. Bindeshwari immediately objected. This man is a sinner, he told her. He may be, she said. But if a poor sinner cannot get refuge at the Lord's feet, then where will he go for refuge? Baba, you put your feet down, or else you might as well go back to the seventh heaven, or wherever it is you came from. Baba put his feet down, and the tearful devotee's wish was fulfilled. 
Afterward, Bindeshwari tried to take her to task for scolding Baba. You have no idea. This fellow was keeping marijuana in his blanket. Baba may have given you the divine sight, she retorted, but I only see one thing, the person's devotion for Baba. One day Ram Tanuka prepared a batch of peras for Baba, a milk sweet that legend has it Krishna loved as a child. She brought them with her to the Jagrati one Sunday and presented them to Baba after he had finished delivering his discourse. Baba, today I have prepared a special dish. It's something I know you love. You will have to eat all of them. I won't allow you to go without finishing them. What have you brought for me, mother? Peras, Baba. Oh, peras? You are quite right. I love peras. But not today, mother. My mother will have my Mia waiting for me when I get home. She would be upset if I spoiled my appetite. I will eat them another time, but not today. Ramtanuka would not be dissuaded. No, Baba, you must eat them today. Finally, in the face of her insistence, Baba relented and accepted one pera. How tasty, he said, with obvious relish. I have never had a pera this tasty. Baba got up to go, but again Ramtanuka insisted. He finished the rest of the plate before he leave. No, mother, no more today, Baba told her, pointing to his stomach. But Ramtanuka would not listen. She continued to insist. All right, he said, but you must feed me from your own hand. Delighted by the offer, Ramtanuka took a pera and Baba opened his mouth. The pera, however, never made it to its destination. She froze in place, her hand still extended, and moments later fell to the ground in trance. Baba calmly got up from his cot and left for home. When she came out of her trance, the other devotees asked her what had happened. When Baba opened his mouth to eat the pera, she said, I saw the whole universe, the sun, moon, stars, galaxies. I saw them all. The entire cosmos was dancing in his mouth. After this experience, she would often lose herself in various states of Baba when she saw Baba, sometimes merely upon hearing Baba's name, a state of affairs that continued for months afterward. Sarala Bihari arrived for her first darshan with Baba in a manner common to many of the female disciples. Her husband brought her and as a proper Hindu wife, she could not refuse. She had taken initiation for the same reason a few months earlier in Jaipur, where her husband, Mangal Bihari, was the Deputy Secretary of Finance for the state government of Rajasthan. When it came time for them to take their next vacation, they decided to go to Puri, a popular beach resort on the east coast of India and one of the important Hindu pilgrimage sites. There they would have an opportunity to perform their worship and enjoy the beaches at the same time. The vacation was planned for two weeks. When Mangal Bihari informed his acharya, Shankarananda, of their plans, Nityananda, who was on tour there, suggested that they stop along the way in Jamalpur and see their guru for the first time an opportunity that Mangal Bihari was eager to take advantage of. When the couple arrived in Jamalpur station, tired after a long journey from Jaipur, they took a rickshaw to the Jagrati. They were expecting to find a traditional Indian ashram, large and luxurious, full of flower-lined paths, shady trees, spreading lawns, marble floors, and comfortable accommodations for visiting devotees. What they found instead was a closed gate to what they could only be described as a rather ramshackle property, seemingly still under construction, in a poorer section of town. No one was there to receive them or even open the gate. After knocking for a few minutes, one of the neighbors stuck her head out and volunteered the information that they were owing Monger for some program. 
Sarala wanted to give up then and there. She suggested to her husband that they find some place to take a shower and then catch the next train for Puri. But he convinced her that as long as they had taken the trouble to get down in Jamalpur, they might as well continue on to Munger. After all, it was only seven kilometers away. They returned to the station and caught a bus that turned out to be full of Margis heading for the DMC program. When they arrived at the DMC site, the first thing they did was to ask where they could find a bathroom to wash up after their long journey. They were directed to some portable bathrooms whose condition so shocked Sarala's sensibilities that she refused to use them. Her aristocratic husband, a bit shocked himself and concerned about his wife, went to talk to the Acharyas about an alternative. One of them suggested they take a rickshaw to the nearby Ganges and bathe there. In the end, it seemed like the best solution possible. When they went to catch a rickshaw, Sarala was startled to see that the rickshaw driver, a tall, dark, bare-chested man, seemed identical to the strange figure she had seen in a troubling dream just before leaving for Puri. When the driver told them he would wait for them while they bathed because they would have difficulties getting a rickshaw back, despite their insistence that it was not necessary, and then disappeared after dropping them off at the DMC site without even collecting his fare. Her sense of foreboding increased exponentially. That evening, Sarala sat in the ladies' section for Baba's DMC discourse. The spectacle of so many women making strange noises, crying and weeping, some throwing up their hands, others falling over, made her think that she had landed in a lunatic asylum. But when Baba finally gave his talk, she was so impressed by the philosophy that she overcame her urge to flee the scene at the first opportunity. After the DMC, the Acharyas arranged for her and her husband to make the short trip back to Jamalpur in Baba's car. Bindeshwari went with them. When Bindeshwari leaned over and whispered to her that she was sitting with Sri Krishna, it reinforced her conviction that she was surrounded by madmen. As guests, they were to stay in the Jagrati. But as soon as they arrived in Jamalpur, Sarala told her husband that she refused to stay there. She was afraid that if she did, she might go mad like the rest of these people obviously had. After talking to some Margis, Mangal Bihari was able to make arrangements for them to stay with Bindeshwari. For the next seven days, Sarala refused to go to the Jagrati to see Baba. She remained behind at Bindeshwari's house while her husband went on field walk each evening or had Baba's darshan at the Jagrati. Each night he came back more and more inspired and each morning she tried to convince him to leave the next day for Puri. He pleaded for one more day and she relented, growing more and more annoyed with each passing moment. When the week was about to finish, her husband realized that he would have a domestic revolt on his hands if he put off their departure any longer. So he went to the station and was able to get reservations for Sunday night. The next morning, Sarala agreed to accompany him to the Sunday darshan, relieved that she was finally getting out of there, and they caught a rickshaw for the Jagrati. Mangal Bihari was sad that this would be his last darshan for who knew how long. But Sarala was glad that her ordeal would soon be over. When the rickshaw arrived at the Jagrati gate, Mangal Bihari noticed Baba walking unaccompanied up the lane, holding his umbrella aloft to protect himself from the late morning sun. Hurriedly, he told his wife to go and touch Baba's feet while he paid the rickshaw driver. By the time he was done haggling over the price, he saw that Baba and his wife had already disappeared through the Jagrati gate. He went in and was somehow able to squeeze into the room where Baba was sitting. Sarala remained with the women crowded outside in the next room, forced to watch Baba through the open door that connected the two rooms, in keeping with the mores of traditional Hindu society, which would have mounted a social scandal had women and men been crowded together so tightly 
in the same room. It was a hot summer day. Baba's discourse went on for what seemed an eternity to Mangal Bihari. Acutely aware of how uncomfortable his wife must be feeling in that heat, sandwiched among a crowd of devotionally maddened females. He knew that the more time that passed, the hotter the reception he would get when he had to face her. When Baba's talk was finally over and the master had passed through the crowd, he went to look for his wife, stealing himself to face her displeasure. Instead, he found her still sitting, her head slumped over and her eyes closed. Surprised, he called her name, but didn't get any response. Then he saw the tears streaming silently down her cheeks. Gradually, it dawned on him that his wife was in some kind of a trance. Finally, she whispered that she did not want to open her eyes. The feeling was so sweet. He sat there patiently until she finally opened them. Then he told her softly that they could go now and get ready to leave for Puri. We are not going anywhere, Sarala told him. We are staying right here with Baba. Afterward, Sarala recounted for her husband and others what had transpired when she went to do pranam to Baba outside the gate. After she touched Baba's feet and straightened up, she saw bright effulgence. Within that effulgence, she saw the image of Shiva that she worshipped at home every Sunday. Then the image metamorphosed back into Baba's form, and it seemed as if the entire world were contained within him. Mother, she heard him say, you must be feeling hot. Come under the umbrella with me. She ducked under the umbrella and accompanied Baba into the ashram. As they walked in, Baba smiled and told her, Bindeshwari says that you have gone near Krishna. Is it so? Inside the gate, the Margis were waiting to garland Baba. One of them gave her a garland to place around Baba's neck. As she garlanded him, Baba said, Mother, you had made me like the Shiva of your desires. Baba went into the room and sat on the cot. She took her seat among the women. When she looked at Baba, the room filled with the same bright effulgence until that was all she could see. And she remained in that state until she heard her husband calling her name. After Sarala and Mangal Bihari returned to Jaipur, they convinced her uncle Tej Karan to take initiation and go to Jamalpur for Baba's darshan. Greatly inspired by their stories of Baba's divine presence and his many miracles, Tej Karan left immediately after promising to write them every day with an account of his experiences. For nine days, he wrote as promised, each letter more discouraged than the previous. He appreciated the spiritual teachings. He admired the rational scientific bent of Baba's philosophy and enjoyed the cheerful company of the devotees. He described all of this amply in his letters, but he had not seen a single miracle. In the ninth letter, he wrote Mangal Bihari that he was going to give it one more day. If he did not see any miracle, then he would not accept Baba as a divine guru and would return to Jaipur. That day in Darshan, Baba looked in his direction and said, A few people are planning to leave today. Before they leave, they want to see a miracle. However, in order to see a miracle, one has to become miraculous oneself. Baba fixed his gaze on Tej Karan. Tej Karan, you have done nothing in your life to deserve seeing a miracle. Still, I am going to show you one. Come here. Tej Karan came to the front of the room and sat in front of Baba. Baba touched him between the eyebrows at the Agya Chakra. Immediately he cried out, flung up his arms, and fell back in a state of trance. Baba instructed several acharyas to massage him and give him hot milk when he came out of samadhi. As they massaged him, Tej Karan writhed and wriggled like a snake. This made it difficult for them to grab hold of him. But as they continued the massage, the convulsions gradually abated and he finally became motionless. 
Afterward, he described his experience. The moment Baba touched me, an immense light penetrated me, and I fell flat. I was in extreme bliss and can feel the Kundalini running from Muladhara to Agia, like an electric current. People told me that I was crying, Baba, Baba, loudly, and throwing my arms and legs, and that he told three Acharyas to massage me. I was in this state for about eight hours. It happened at eight in the morning, and I remained like that until around five in the afternoon. I kept on singing and crying and feeling the current pass through me. It gradually decreased until I became normal. After that, I wrote Mangal Bihari that I had realized that Baba was the Supreme Consciousness. I wrote it on a postcard. It was my last letter. It was such an ineffable experience that I couldn't describe it. It would take Tej Karan a full month before he would regain his normal consciousness. In the winter of 1960, a college student by the name of Arun, who was studying in Musafapur, arrived in Jamalpur for his first darshan. He arrived at the ashram about eight in the evening and had his personal contact, an experience that he would not be willing to share. He would only say that it was the most cherished memory of his life. Afterward, Baba called everybody into the room for darshan. It was quite dark, nearing the time of new moon, and Baba was in a jovial mood. He asked Dasarath, Do you want to see God? Yes, Baba. Baba pointed toward the open window and told Dasarath, See Paramatma in the sky. Yes, Baba, I see him, Dasarath replied. Then Baba told him in succession to see Paramatma in the room in his shoe, and in the glasses Arun was wearing. Each time, Dasarath replied that he saw the Divine Presence there. Paramatma is everywhere, and you have seen him, Baba said. Some people think that Paramatma dwells in the seventh heaven. Now that you have seen him, you know that he dwells not only in the farthest sky, but that he is everywhere and in everything. Now I will bring the nucleus of this cosmos to this room and you will hear the sound Om resonating here. After a short pause, Baba asked Dasarath if he were hearing the sound. Yes, Baba, it is very loud. You will continue to hear the sound all through the night, Baba said. Then Baba pointed toward the open doorway. Many Siddhas have entered the room and are congregating there. Look, do you see them? Yes, Baba, there are many of them. Baba pointed to one Margi sitting to the side of his cot. Gaze into his mental plate and see if there is any stain in his mind. Baba, Dasarath exclaimed, his sadhana is so good that there is no stain at all in his mind. Baba turned toward the Margi and said, Very good, very good. Go ahead with your sadhana, with all sincerity and effort and you will be successful. For nearly two hours, Baba continued performing similar demonstrations. Finally, Arun was chosen, along with Dasarath and several others, to accompany Baba to his house. After Baba entered his gate, Arun went up to Dasarath, burning with curiosity, and asked him what he had seen during the demonstration. Dasarath broke into a broad smile, like an innocent child. Whenever Baba pointed, I saw a soothing, milky white light in the sky, in Baba's shoe, in the room, in your glasses. I saw the entire world enveloped in that beautiful effulgence. It was everywhere. At that time, the Jamalpur Jagriti did not have a flush toilet but only a service toilet that required frequent cleaning. Once, when the person who regularly cleaned it was absent for several days, it reached such a state that the devotees had to think twice about using it. Jaidari Pandit, a young disciple from an upper caste family who was visiting from Motihari, 
thought it deplorable that such a situation should exist in the place where his guru came every day to meet the devotees. Despite his caste prohibitions, he took it upon himself to clean the toilet. Afterward, he took a bath at the well and changed his clothes, but he was unable to shake the conviction that the foul odor still clung to his body. He sniffed his right hand and then his left, distinctly uncomfortable, sure that he had not gotten rid of it. At dusk, Baba showed up at the Jagrati, unexpected and unannounced. It was only when a couple of Margi saw him standing in the courtyard that anyone realized he was there. They started shouting, Baba has come, Baba has come. This brought Madab, the Jagrati manager, running. After doing pranam, he told Baba that he would make immediate arrangements for General Darshan. No, Baba told him, I won't sit for Darshan today. But please call Jai Dari and tell him that I want to speak to him. Jai Dari, who was meditating in Baba's room at the time, came running as soon as he was called. After accepting his pranam, Baba asked him to extend his hands. He took Jaidari's hands in his own and started smelling them. Jaidari, what a beautiful fragrance is coming from your hands. Jaidari recoiled in embarrassment, thinking that Baba was teasing him for the bad smell. But Baba said, No, no, it's true, Jaidari. Smell your right hand. Jaidari smelled his right hand and was stunned to discover a wonderful fragrance coming from it. Now smell your left hand. He smelled his left hand and discovered a different, indescribably beautiful fragrance. In fact, Baba continued, it seems that wonderful fragrances are coming from every part of your body. Jaidari smelled other parts of his body, and in each, he discovered a different beautiful fragrance. He felt exalted by a growing sense of ecstasy. Baba patted his cheek and said, Good actions always bear good results. Then Baba left the Jagrati for home to get ready for his normal field walk. One of Baba's favorite passages from the Bhagavad Gita, one that he would often quote for the disciples, was, This Maya is insurmountable, but he who has taken shelter in me will surely go beyond the influence of this Maya. Many of the disciples, took this teaching to heart and came to rely on Baba, not only for their spiritual salvation, but to rescue them from their mundane difficulties as well. Ram Bahadur Singh was one of these, a deputy superintendent of police in charge of highway vigilance in Barhi. His refusal to accept bribes or cooperate in any way with the criminal element in that town had made him many enemies, a fact which he would shrug off, saying, Baba will take care. In the summer of 1960, Ram Bahadur, who invariably spent his weekends and holidays in Jamalpur, began losing the sight in one eye. He took advantage of his proximity to Baba to request the master's help. Ram Bahadur, Baba told him, why are you asking me? You should see an eye specialist and get it properly treated. Ram Bahadur caught hold of Baba's feet and repeated his request. Baba, only you can help me. I don't have faith in any doctor. Ram Bahadur, stop pestering me. Go see an eye specialist. This scene repeated itself a number of times as the summer progressed. Finally, when his sight had completely failed in that eye, he went and saw an eye specialist who told him that his problem was due to an untreatable degenerative condition. He caught the next train to Jamalpur. As soon as he had a chance to go into Baba's room, he caught Baba's feet and implored him to restore his eyesight. Baba, I saw the doctor just as you told me I should, but he said that he can't do anything for me. Only you can save me. Okay, Ram Bahadur, do one thing. There is a plant growing in your courtyard. If you extract the juice from that plant and apply it to your eye, then you will recover your sight. 
Baba explained to him how to recognize a plant and prepare and apply the extract. But Ram Bahadur was not satisfied. Baba, you should cure me. If you wish it, you can cure me instantly. An exasperated tone crept into Baba's voice. I told you how to cure your eye. Baba, I will take the medicine, but it is only you who can cure me, not any medicine. When Ram Bahadur returned home, he extracted the juice from the plant as instructed. After a few days, he started noticing some slight improvement. A couple of days later, Baba passed through Barhi on his way back from a DMC program. As soon as Ram Bahadur heard that Baba had reached, he hurried home from his office to give his pranam. He had already arranged a two-day leave so he could accompany Baba back to Jamalpur. Ram Bahadur, Baba asked, how is your eye now? Baba, it is improving. It is still swollen, but I am starting to get some sight back. Very good. Then I want you to drive me to Jamalpur. But Baba, how can I drive you with my eye in this condition? You just sit in the driver's seat and drive. Baba reached out his hand and placed it over Ram Bahadur's eye. Ram Bahadur experienced bright effulgence in the affected eye. When the momentary radiance cleared, he found that his vision was completely restored. A year or two later, Baba again passed through Barhi on his way back from Ranchi. Ram Bahadur was on duty at the time. When he saw Baba's car, he took advantage of his police authority to stop it and give Baba his pranam. How are you doing, Ram Bahadur? Baba asked. How is your health? I am fine, Baba, he replied. But the very next day he fell seriously ill and was forced to go on medical leave. Over the next three weeks, he saw doctors in Berili, Kodarma, and Chaivasa, but his condition continued to worsen. Then his brother offered to bring him to Patna, where he would be assured to receive the best treatment possible. Ram Bahadur reluctantly accepted his brother's offer. His wife was afraid to be left alone with the children. Ram Bahadur had made powerful enemies among the local coal mafia, having made it impossible for them to transport stolen coal along the local highways. But he assured her that Baba would take care of them. Ram Bahadur saw the doctors in Patna, but his condition worsened even further. He began to pray out loud to Baba to be merciful and let him leave his physical body rather than force him to undergo such suffering. His brother was horrified to hear this kind of prayer. You have a wife and small children, he told him. Who would look after them? How can you even think of such a thing? After he had calmed his brother down, Ram Bahadur decided to write a letter to Baba to explain his predicament and ask for his help. A couple of days later, when Baba passed by the Jagrati in the morning, he asked Pranay if he had received a letter from Ram Bahadur. Yes, Baba. A letter arrived just this morning. Read it out to me. After listening to the letter, Baba dictated a reply in which he told Ram Bahadur that he would be all right. He should not worry. The only remedy he needed was to repeat his Ishta mantra while lying on his bed, especially at night. There was no need for him to sit up to repeat his mantra. Ram Bahadur was overjoyed when he received Baba's reply. He started paying more attention to his mantra, and from the following day his condition started to improve. When he was completely well again, he took a train back home, having been gone a total of 40 days. When his wife came to receive him at the station, she had a curious tale to tell. At nightfall, on the day he'd left, two huge, ferocious-looking black dogs appeared in front of the property and started roaming around the house as if they were on guard duty. At the slightest sound, they would begin growling and barking fiercely. This eased her apprehensions about being left alone there with the children. In the morning, 
She gave the dogs some milk and bread. After that, they never left the premises, not even for a moment. Ram Bahadur didn't say anything, but he remained thoughtful. When they arrived at the house, she called for the dogs to show her husband, but the dogs were no longer there. Ram Bahadur closed his eyes and folded his hands to his chest in a silent pranam. Baba sent those dogs, he told her. You see, Baba always takes care. The dogs were never seen again. One night, Ram Chandra Paswan had to change trains at Baruni Junction on the north side of the river Ganges. Unfortunately, his connection was not due in until the morning. He found an empty bench on the platform where he hoped to get some rest while he was waiting. It was a hot summer night, so he changed into a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and placed his folded pants and shirt on top of his suitcase below the bench. He wanted very much to be able to catch a few hours of sleep, so he decided to entrust his belongings to Baba. He told Baba mentally that he was too sleepy to stay awake. Could he please watch over his luggage while he was taking rest? He closed his eyes and was soon fast asleep. When he woke up in the morning, however, his luggage and his clothes were gone, his money as well, since he had left his wallet inside the suitcase. In a fit of frustration, he got angry at Baba. Baba, when I went to sleep, I left you in charge of my belongings. What were you doing? Were you also asleep? Everything I had is gone. Now I'm going to get home with only a pair of shorts and no money. He dropped his head into his hands, blaming Baba and wondering what he was going to do next. Just then, an elderly man stopped in front of the bench and addressed him. Why are you blaming your guru for your own carelessness? That's not right. Anyhow, if you run out to the bus stand, you will find the man who has stolen your luggage. The man turned and walked away. Ramchandra jumped up and rushed to the bus stand. When he reached there, he saw a man carrying a suitcase. He started running after him, shouting. The thief ran away and managed to escape, but only after dropping the suitcase. The next time Ram Chandra went to Jamalpur for General Darshan, Baba started talking about how fond the disciples were of testing the Guru. They will go so far as to ask him to guard their luggage so that they can sleep on a railway platform. Looking at Ram Chandra, he smiled and said, If I would ever take a real test of my disciples, not very many would pass. In one of his Sunday discourses, Baba talked about the five faces of Shiva. He explained the symbolism behind this concept of ancient Indian mythology. In the center is the eternally blissful face of Kalyana Sundaram. Beyond thought, beyond manifestation, while the other four, two on each side, show varying degrees of sweetness and sternness, causing the devotee to shed either tears of joy and laughter or tears of suffering, remorse, and pain. All four are aspects of Rudra, a name of Shiva that means one who makes others shed tears. In Baba's general darshans, the disciples experienced all five faces of Shiva and the tears that went with them. From the divine bliss of Samadhi to the extreme discomfort of having their ego, forcefully powdered down under the all-seeing glare of their guru's eyes. The face on the far left is known as Vamadeva, the fiercest face of Shiva, the one who mets out merciless punishment to the created beings when necessary for their correction. This was the face of Shiva that would make the devotees tremble when they saw it manifest in Baba, the one they did their best to avoid. Though as Baba pointed out in his discourse, the underlying purpose is to teach people not to harm them. One day, Taraknath Ghosh, a police inspector, was sitting in Darshan when Baba asked him if he was doing his meditation twice a day. 
Yes, Baba, Taraknath replied. But occasionally, I miss a session due to time pressure. Do you follow Yama Niyama, Baba asked. Yes, Baba. Is that so? Suddenly Baba's tone became stern and his face grew menacing, as if a storm cloud had passed across the face of the sun. Then why did you accept a bribe on such a such day from such a such person? Is this how you follow Yama Niyama? Tell me. Taraknath started shivering. I made a mistake, Baba. I see. Baba then asked a poor Margi from Bagalpur to stand up. Do you do your sadhana twice a day, he asked. I try, Baba, but it is very difficult. During sadhana time, I am busy tending my cattle. Then when do you do your sadhana? Baba, when my cattle become tired and are resting or grazing nearby, then I sit under a tree and do my meditation. We need people like you in Ananda Marga, not police officers who take bribes. Baba turned again to Taraknath. Taragosh, as long as you continue with this filthy practice, don't come here to visit me. I don't want to see your face. Tarak started crying. He went out to the veranda and wept where everyone could hear him. In the meantime, Baba continued talking with the rest of the Margis, with his usual serene expression on his face, as if nothing had happened. On another occasion, Devi Chand stopped in Kyul to change trains on his way to Jamalpur from Ranchi. While in Kyul, a leper entered his third-class compartment and sat on the floor. Devi Chand started to rebuke him. How dare you, a leper, enter this train? Devi Chand got down and alerted the railway authorities that there was a leper in his compartment. The railway officials came and removed the leper. When Devi Chand arrived at the Jagrati, Baba was sitting with the devotees. He went in front of Baba's cot and did Sastang Pranam. When he got up, he saw Baba glaring at him. Devi Chand, Baba said, this tendency you have of detesting other human beings has grown very powerful. Baba, I don't understand, he said, tears welling in his eyes in the face of Baba's displeasure. When you asked the leper in Kyul to leave your compartment, your mind was full of contempt. You caused him great pain. You are a sadhaka. You should never do such a thing. Such people deserve our mercy, not our contempt. Devi Chand started crying openly. It was a lesson that he would remain acutely conscious of until the end of his life, many years later. Ratneshwar was the leader of the Yadavs, the dominant local caste in his native village of Shrinagar, not far from Maraha. For several years, the Yadavs had been in conflict with the other main caste group of the village, sometimes leading to open fighting between the two. One evening, he was invited to attend a mediation session in a house on the other side of the village. While he was walking there, a snake crossed his path and lifted its body up to face him. He backed off and took another path. But the same snake appeared again to block his way. Again he backed off and chose another route, and again the snake appeared. This happened twice more. When the snake appeared for a fifth time, he was ready with a large stone. Just as he was readying the stone, the snake slithered into the brush and didn't appear again. The next time Ratneshwar attended Darshan again in Jamalpur, Baba started scolding him. Haven't I told you not to get involved in village politics and caste conflicts? You refuse to listen. Baba, it's not true. I stopped that. What are you saying? Then tell me, what was that meeting you attended the other night? Even when somebody comes and tries to stop you, you don't stop. Isn't it so? 
Didn't someone try to stop you repeatedly? Ratneshwar bowed his head. Yes, Baba. A snake tried to stop me. And you thought to kill it with a stone, didn't you? Is that how you follow Yama and Yama? No, Baba. And why didn't you kill the snake? Because it disappeared, Baba. And how many times did it try to stop you? Five times, Baba. And still you didn't pay heed. Are you ready to take punishment for your actions? Baba asked Ratneshwar to do 40 tick ticks in front of the Margis. Kuldeep Narayan Dubé had become an Acharya and was making fast progress in his sadhana. But he had also started developing some ego. He began thinking of himself as a great yogi with budding spiritual powers. He recalled in an interview how Baba put his pride to a fall. I went to see Baba in the ashram one winter night, but no one was there, not even the ashram manager. So I went to sleep. When I woke up in the early morning, I saw Baba through the window. He was coming in through the gate. I quickly threw on my clothes. By that time, Baba was standing on the veranda, reading the notice board. I did Sastang Pranam. As I was getting up, Baba touched my body, and I fell down to the ground, unconscious. When I came to my senses, Baba was standing over me and smiling. I asked him what he had done to me, whether he wanted to kill me or not. Baba told me I had developed some pride in my spiritual power. He had come to put an end to that pride. I tried to get up, but my body was extremely sluggish. None of my limbs were working. There were only the two of us. Baba told me to try to get up. I tried several times, but I couldn't do it. My body had become totally inactive. Baba then went into his room. I could hear him inside his room, shouting for me to try and get up. I shouted back, How can I get up in this condition? He called out for me to keep trying. Finally, after many attempts, I was able to get up and go to his room. Baba asked me whether the pride of power in me was finished or not. I told him it was. He asked me whose power it was. I told him it was all his power. This sterner side of Baba was not reserved for disciples alone. Ananda Prasad Thakur, who worked under Astana in the Central Excise Department, remembered entering a train with Baba and sitting across from a group of teenagers, one boy and three girls. Baba asked the boy in a stern tone of voice who the girls were. It was a tone of voice I was quite familiar with. The boy replied that they were members of his family. Suddenly, Baba started rebuking him. You bastard, you liar. The boy was shocked. Baba started telling who the girls were and where they were from. The moment he began exposing the unsavory relations between the four of them, the teenagers fled the compartment. The rest of the passengers were astonished to see this. Even the littlest deviation from Baba's teachings came under the microscope of his scrutiny. Once Rameshwar Baita, who by then had been transferred to the Danapur office of Customs and Central Excise, asked his secretary to type out his name and post it on the back of his office chair, as his fellow employees had taken to doing. The following Sunday, he went to Jamalpur for darshan. Baba gave a talk on the universe, as a joint property of all. In the middle of the talk, he looked at Rameshwar and said, Rameshwar, just because you paste your name on the back of your chair, it doesn't mean that it becomes your property. Then he continued with his discourse. One hot summer afternoon in the Jagrati, Acharya Deep Narayan and Hari Narayan Sahu got involved in a heated discussion about casteism and the significance of racial differences. Deep Narayan argued the part of the philosophy, while Hari Narayan stubbornly insisted 
that such differences would remain in everyday life, even if he accepted on principle what the Acharya was saying. Suddenly, in the middle of their conversation, they were stunned to see Baba standing next to them. They had been so engrossed in their discussion that they had failed to see him enter the Jagrati gate. Baba called them both into his room and started scolding them. I was taking rest at home in this terrible afternoon heat when I overheard two sadhakas of the Marga discussing the caste system. One of them was trying to justify his existence. So I put on my shirt and my shoes and rushed over here. Now what do you have to say for yourselves? Both disciples kept quiet. I was started explaining the evils of the caste system to Harinarayan. He did not stop until his wayward disciple had fully gotten the point. One Margi from Trimohan, Surendra, remembered going home one day during this period when a poisonous snake crossed his path. Frightened, he called Baba's name and the snake turned away. Even then, Surendra took the bamboo staff he was carrying and killed it. A few days later, Baba came to Trimohan. When Baba was leaving, Surendra was one of a large number of Margis who went to the station to see him off. Baba called him over and started scolding him. Surendra, why did you kill that snake when you were walking home the other day? You took my name and it turned away. Why did you have to be so cruel by beating him? You were beating me. Just look. Baba lifted his shirt and exposed several welts on his back. Early in 1960, a young student from Ranchi named Asim Kumar came to Jamalpur to enjoy Baba's darshan for a few days. One morning, he woke up somewhat late by ashram standards. Just as Ananta Ram and his family were sitting down to a breakfast of fresh puris, yogurt, beaten rice, singaras, and warm jalebis, a Bihari sweet especially popular on cold winter mornings. They invited Asim to come and join them for breakfast. When Asim protested that he hadn't meditated yet, Ananta Ram said, It would be cold by then. Take some breakfast and then go and meditate. His advice seemed reasonable and the food very attractive. So Asim joined him for breakfast. When he was finished, he went to the well to wash his clothes and take a bath before sitting for meditation. Just then Baba entered the Jagrati gate in a lungi and t-shirt rather than his usual dhoti and kurta and an umbrella in his hand. It was not yet 7.30, well before Baba's usual time to come to the Jagrati. As Baba passed by the well on the way to his room, Asim could see that he was in a serious mood. Baba called everyone who was staying in the Jagrati to his room, some 10 or 15 people. Once they were gathered there, he asked them how they were, if they had meditated and taken breakfast. Some had eaten, some had not, but everyone had done their meditation, except one. Asim was sitting in a corner. Baba pointed to him without looking and said, Ask this boy if he has done his meditation or not. He has not meditated, but he has already taken his breakfast. Then he looked at Asim. Did I make this ashram for goats or for human beings? How is it you feel hungry so early in the morning, before you have even meditated? Baba, I'm sorry. I will fast the whole day. No, no, Baba said, softening his tone. You can't fast. If you don't eat, then how can I eat? Baba, please give me punishment. Very well. Rub your nose on the ground in front of everyone. Asim rubbed his nose so hard, it started bleeding. Why did you rub your nose so hard, Baba asked. He told him to run into the garden and pick some leaves from a certain plant and pressed them to his nose. Asim did so and felt immediate relief from the pain. He returned to Baba's room 
and again insisted on fasting. Don't fast, Baba said, smiling now. But promise me, you won't ever do it again. Because of you, I wasn't able to finish my housework in peace. I had to run here at this early hour. Whether their mistakes were large or small, the tears the Margis cried only served to bring them closer to the master, whose reprimands they cherished almost as much as his affection. Their relationship, as Baba pointed out time and again, was purely personal. He was not only their teacher, he was their father, and as their father, he showered them with affection and took them to task for their mistakes, sometimes in a single breath. Even when they were singled out for punishment, either alone or in front of the Margis, they took it as a blessing. It meant they had Baba's attention. And his attention was the boat they were sure would see them across the ocean of Maya. They could live with him rubbing their ego into the ground. What they could not live with was his indifference. And while Baba could be as stern as he was loving, he was never indifferent. As long as the disciple was sincere, no matter how misguided or wayward that disciple might be. And so they came, ready for whatever face Baba chose to show them, whatever face of Shiva they saw. It was, after all, Shiva's face they were seeing. Thank you.